Copyright is coming for UK pirates. Computers invade Toys R Us. And New York bans arcades, but not peep shows. These stories and many more, many, many more, on this episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Makes them crazy, man. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. Welcome back to the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine, the show where we travel back in time to find out what was making headlines in the home computer and video game industries of yesteryear. My name is Carl, and I am joined again by everybody's favorite co-host, Mads. Welcome back. And man, do we have some headlines for you today. Oh, yes, because today, everybody, our faithful listeners know we're heading back 40 years to August of 1982. And this is, I don't know if the next couple months are going to be even worse, but this is count up to the crash on steroids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we just have so much. Uh, do we just want to bypass the banter and get straight to it? I think we should, mate. I think we need yeah, to. Yeah, we should. We should. Everybody, uh, links in the show notes. Remember to follow us on Patreon. You know, support us. Get early access to the interviews. I am going to be blasting a whole bunch of interviews that I have that have been just gathering dust. I'm going to be posting them on the Patreon, so it won't just be the next three interviews. It's probably going to end up being more like the next eight or nine interviews will be up there early as soon as I'm caught up chronologically so that the episodes are coming out. Actually, you know, we're recording this the 2nd of September. Uh, so as soon as I do get caught up again, we will be posting – uh, interview episodes to the regular feed again, but I just need to get the stuff out of the way and I'll be posting those to Patreon. So if you do want to check those out, there's some amazing ones uh, already recorded and a couple of really good ones coming down the pipeline too. So, you know, for a buck a month, you get early access to that as well as the video version of our first segment, which is the seven minutes in heaven when our intrepid co-host must play a game that was reviewed in a publication dated August of 1982 that they have never played before for seven minutes. We had a lot of interesting contenders this time, including classics like Donkey Kong Jr., Pitfall, Empire Strikes Back, Cosmic Arc, and we went with Kangaroo. kangaroo yes so mads are you ready for some kangarooing i am and i'm guessing that that's a verb and if it wasn't it should be okay it, definitely <laughs> let's do it Welcome back from your seven minutes in heaven, Mads, for the uninitiated who have never played Kangaroo before. How would you describe it based off your seven minutes with the game? So it's a single screen platform, very much in the way of Donkey Kong. You start at the bottom of the screen and uh, you need to make your way to the top of the screen where your little your little Joey has been caught. It's not Pauline. It's not your girlfriend you're saving here. It's, it's your, your kid, Joey. And uh, he's jumping around blindfolded on the top level, and you need to avoid the monkeys throwing fruit at you. You can punch them with your boxing gloves, and uh, if they actually get to throw the fruit, you, you can dodge it. You can either either crouch down or you can jump over the fruit. And um, there's also a monkey of a different color uh, in the top layer, the top level, eating apples and throwing apple cores so that falls down at you. You need to avoid as well. And... That's it, really. Jumping between platforms, uh, trying to to uh, not get 
hit by the different fruit falling or the monkeys and getting all the way to the top to to save your little Joey. And later on, I, I'm I've only I mean with seven minutes I only got to the third level and only just to the beginning of the third level really. There was a bit more depth to the gameplay there. There was uh, something with uh, hitting some other kinds of monkeys so that uh, a cage would fall down where your Joey was in this time. He wasn't at the top of the level, so there was some something that that changed a bit uh, from level two to three, for example. So I'm not sure how many levels there are here, but I would think in a game of this age, four or five would be it, and then it would just uh, recycle them, right? That Now you're asking me something I don't know because I played this for like five minutes before putting it on the list just mm. to test it out. Uh, I knew the game by reputation, uh, especially because it was one of the weird examples of a game that Atari had actually licensed from a Japanese manufacturer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and this didn't really happen that much. I mean, Atari was kind of like... You know, we're doing our own thing, but they had just done Dig Dug before this, and so they're so they, they licensed it for fun. using a, the on the twenty six hundred or no, no, they actually released the arcade game and then also did uh, oh, all okay. the obligatory ports. So they did the Atari eight bit, the twenty six hundred, and the fifty two hundred. Okay, all get ports of this game. And uh, it's it's interesting to look at the screenshots of the ports because the 5200 version actually does a fairly good job of recreating it. But uh, and the patron patrons who have already watched the video version of this will know uh, we did talk a little bit about the graphics. Uh, it's not you said it's it's similar in vain structurally to Donkey Kong, but technologically yeah. it's not on the same level as Donkey Kong, is it? No, even though it's, uh, it's it's younger than Donkey Kong, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sprite overlap or hitboxes suddenly popping in and out of the screen. Yep. So it is one of those games where it's clear that technologically speaking, it may not be the sharpest game, but there's a lot of ideas in here and a lot of different changing mechanics from level to level. Yeah, I wonder how much of that would have been uh, because of the the emulation. I mean, running on a real CRT, and and I'm I'm sure even Vame said something about there are some known errors with this uh, this ROM when I started it up. So so maybe it looked better in real life actually. It's possible, uh, mm. especially because you have an interlaced screen. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, a lot of it would have been hidden or people just wouldn't have noticed back then. Let's be honest. Yeah, we were very, be. very forgiving in those days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow I still am when playing these old games. <laughs> you have to be. I mean, well, you have to appreciate them for the context of their time. Yes. And if you can't do that, I mean, you're missing the point. Uh, that's That's like people who don't watch old movies because they're in black and white. I mean, Mm. No, no. I'm sorry, but uh, there are a few things as great as A Face in the Crowd or Twelve Angry Men or Grapes of Wrath. Mm. And uh, sorry, I'm going down a movie buff thing. But uh, <laughs> OK, your recommendation, play or not play? If you're into your old school arcade games, definitely play. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I'm, I do love my Donkey Kong. So, and this was no Donkey Kong, but uh, I'm not sure that it, it couldn't be if I uh, practiced a bit more because it was actually really good fun to play. Cool. Then in that case, uh, everybody, you've got your recommendations. Go check it out. Uh, and before we can turn on the time machine and head back to August of 1982, we do have to check in with our good friend Ethan in the Department of Corrections to find out what I got wrong when we went back to July of 1982. Hello, this is a prepaid collect call from the Department of Corrections. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. To accept charges, press 1. You may start the conversation now. Welcome back, Ethan. So, for you to uh, eviscerate me for my errors in July of 1982, we have... The Mad's Comment! 
Hi, Mads. I see you. That is all for the Mads comment. All right, back to the Department of Corrections for July 1982. Carl, present yourself. Hold your head high as we repeatedly bash you with this (laughs) very sharp piece of paper. Okay. Death by a thousand paper cuts. I knew it was going to come to this. As you should have. As you should have. All right. So this one is one you weren't certain of. So you did state uncertainty, but it's still being corrected. The Bradley Trainer, the uh, specialized version of Battlezone, which you talked about, it did have custom controls to make it more accurate as a simulator. Yeah. Um, uh, right after we recorded, of course, I Googled it and saw the controls. I think they added a lot of buttons to that game. Yes, because it was meant to truly uh, help people uh, operate a Bradley uh, tank vehicle. Yeah. And, but they only made, I believe, two of them, right? We don't know the number. At any time anyone throws out a number, it's stupid and not real. Um, gotcha. But uh, Historic Nerd did a video on this, which I helped out with. Uh, so oh. I would suggest linking that in the show notes. The Army Battle Zone. If you search that, then you'll find it. Okay, very cool. Will do. Next, we have Zaxxon, the wave of the future, as it was in 1982. <laughs> they, so Zaxxon was as, like, there is no indication by anything in the trades before this that there was a consumer-focused arcade ad by a manufacturer. There is and no, now you're talking about TV ad. Any, any ad. Like maybe okay. the maybe the the print ads that started at yeah I guess in electronic games like Bally started doing print ads so yeah I, I guess mo- moving picture ad of gotcha. some kind or even even radio ad like they did a, a support eight radio ads for Zaxxon as well oh, wow. there was a um like we know that some arcades did advertising for we have a location um but. No manufacturer had ever said you need to play this game because it is in it is in the arcade now. Never happened before. Wow, that is that's kind of weird. Not really, because they were ne- their customers aren't the players. Their customers are the distributors. Well, I know, but still, it's I mean, if you're gonna do, if you're, if, if, I guess. There's really not a lot of mediums that they could have gone to other than print ads in uh, trade magazines like Replay and Play Meter that really would have been meaningful. So I guess it's just kind of weird that uh, nobody had thought of it. But then again, this is also the first few months of most of the gaming magazines. So I guess, yeah, why, you you wouldn't put it in a newspaper. So it may Makes sense. A couple things. Very few of these companies had any cash. They were never operating with active cash flow that they could spend towards something like advertising on a large scale like this. Second, people didn't conceptualize of advertising as this sort of broad range thing before television advertising. And television advertising, even though it existed from the dawn of television, didn't really take off until the 70s. There's a, I re, I've read a lot of ad stuff because there's a lot of interesting little video game stuff tucked in there. Um, they there was a huge debate over whether or not even you know even before the big deregulations came whether you should even bother advertising on television. Wow. It's just yeah there's a lot of debate from the people in the ad industry is it worth it at all? So there was no idea that. The television ad was the ad you needed to do to reach a broad demographic. Interesting. Okay. That does put it in a very, very different perspective. That's cool. And ultimately, not many other arcade games would follow in this suit because it's just not worth it. Like, mm-hmm. he, it is ve- like I can barely think of the other arcade games that had an ad by the manufacturer. It is very few. Yeah, the only one I can think of is, uh, off the top of my head, is that animated gauntlet one. But I don't know if that was actually aired on T 
TV or if that was just used for in uh, trade events? Well, there were there were also theater ads like uh, right in this period as well. There was a Dig Dug theatrical ad that was aired. Oh, really? um, and uh, Sega, after this, will do one for Star Trek as well, starring Leonard Nimoy. OK, now that I have to Google. It is not I've online. I've it. looked for it. Uh, really? Nobody, nobody has digitized it. Oh, that 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 is my new quest now to find somebody <laughs> with a copy of that, because that I want to see. Wow. And, OK, uh, sorry. I'm just trying to picture <laughs> that in my head right now. And it's awesome. He did also do the advertising for the Odyssey, too, or in voiceover, at least. Oh, you're for the Odyssey, too? Yeah. Leonard Nimoy does the voice on the Odyssey 2 commercials. Oh, wow. OK, uh, that also puts now which Odyssey 2 right at the beginning of the launch or by. I 80s? think they were a little later. I think they, it was more in the 80s than the, the 70s. I don't think they did any TV advertisement in the 70s because um, I think he talks about like the, the voice module and stuff in those commercials. So, OK. Oh, those were then, TV yeah. commercials, though. Yeah, then that's definitely 80, uh, 82, 83 in this time period because um, the voice modulator is going to actually be one of the stories in this in this episode. Yeah. So whatever it is, uh, you know, th- so that's that's a perspective on television advertising you don't often hear about. One other thing on Zaxxon is you said that it was made in the old Gremlin facility before they moved. As far as I can tell, they only made it in the new facility because the new facility, even though they reported on it having a grand opening in May, it was actually operational by February. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay, so that kind of makes sense then that they would probably, yeah, why build it in the old facility? Yeah, as far as I know, Zaxxon was only made in that facility. I think they did do some additional uh, stuff on Frogger in that facility, even though they did most of it in the older one. I believe I've been told that um, they also did some Froggers in there as well. But Zaxxon was the big one. They made... Definitely a couple thousand of them before the, you know, the choke. Cool. Okay. Ah, uh, the choke. Sorry, just <laughs> calling it that is kind of funny. Okay, let's. Okay, let's move uh, on. So you were discussing some ColecoVision stuff, and you were wondering how the timeline of the Famicom fits into this. The Famicom was being worked on at this time. Uh, there's a, there's a big article from back in the day. They began the general project in December 1981, and then they got to see the ColecoVision before it was released. Um, but they were all they were already working on something, so it wasn't like they were directly copying from the ColecoVision. Not that it had any specific uh, crossover in terms of technology or anything. But you you put this thing that the way Nintendo of America factors into uh, how how this all works out, there, N- Nintendo of America do, absolutely does not factor into uh, how the Famicom is being developed at this time. The F- Nintendo of America is an arcade subsidiary that at this time has absolutely no ambitions to do anything consumer-based, and I mean, e- even when they later try to sell the Famicom to Atari, it's pretty clear that they don't see the uh, the American subsidiary as an extension of that business. You can also see this in Sega, which at the time was working on their console, the SG-1000 in Japan, and the American subsidiary had nothing to do with it, not a single thing. I, well, but this is where that quote that i use that came directly from a nintendo rep talking about how their new facility uh in washington state could be used for uh for non-arcade uh product that can mean a million things that yeah uh and i have to look up exactly what the verbiage was but they were talking about consumer products which, of course, could have been uh, just uh, the handheld units. Yeah, they did get into the Game & Watch as kind of a test of what they could do. But, yeah, yeah they, the Famicom does not factor into – I mean, the NOA does not factor into the decisions around the Famicom at all. 
whether or not they had the the strong ambition to take it to the United States. Of course, they talk with Atari in the sense that they do want to take it there. Uh, it just wasn't it wasn't a, a forefront of their minds at all. Oh, I'm sure. No, no, no. OK. Uh, and. So an- moving on. Yes. Another Nintendo related thing you I think you said that the Nintendo Magnavox lawsuit was settled fairly quickly, and no, it was not. Um, oh, okay. I believe it was it was filed in '86, and I believe it concluded in '89. Oh wow! Uh, okay. All of these Magnavox lawsuits take a while, even if it just ends in a settlement of by which Magnavox gets their gets their money. Um, yeah, the Magnavox does not does not screw around, and everyone thinks they can beat them. Ah. Uh. And they never learn, or at least, well, they they all learn except for Activision. So, ah, <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it's it's not that Activision was the only one to lose to Magnavox. Most, you know, most people settled, but um, yeah, there were there were many decisions made along the way. But well, we should uh, talk a little bit about that in a uh, future bonus. Yes, we we need to start uh, getting those lined up. Okay. So, uh, anything else that I got wrong? Yes, there is always more, Carl. Always. Oh, I thought we were sticking done. to okay. Nintendo. U- Universal and the Donkey Kong rights. Universal did not quote unquote find out that they did not own the rights to Donkey Kong. They knew, and that was part of the reason why the judge was so pissed at them. They had proven in court that they did not own the rights to uh, King Kong. Uh, they, the whole situation is complicated, but they, in order to make the remake, but, you know, Dion De, De Laurentiis's remake, they had to prove that King Kong, there, there's an element of King Kong in the public domain, the character of King Kong. Okay. So the character had fallen into the public domain. Yes. It's a complicated thing because there is both a novel and a movie. The movie, the protected elements of the movie are copyrighted. The novel fell out of copyright. Oh, wow. I and can't that believe meant it. the character fell out of copyright. Oh, jeez. Now, it was a novelization of the film. It didn't start out as a novel, did it? It was, bo- it was both at the same time. Okay. And the guy, And so the guy who wrote the novel owned the King Kong character. Oh, he sold the King Kong character to RKO Pictures. Gotcha. Wow, that is bad luck. <laughs> bad decisions. <laughs> but yeah, they so eventually when when the judge comes around on Universal, be like, well, you uh, were pretty much lying to everybody, and uh, I do not care uh, for your arguments anymore. Goodbye. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, it's it's sweet justice. Even even if you don't like Nintendo, you can't you can't help but cheer for them a little bit when they get one over on Universal for that. That's true. You gotta love that. Oh wow! Next, we have uh, Epics. E-P-Y-X, or Automated Simulations. You, this was a, a mistake you've made before. John Freeman was not a co-founder of Automated Simulations. Very specifically, John Connolly said this to Alex. Oh, okay. So what was his role in the founding, if it, if any? He Well, they had known each other before then, and after John Connolly founded it, he gave stock to John, but the, oh, he did okay. not co-found it. Yeah, and I keep going back because it's stuck in the back of my brain. Uh, the way the story is narrated in the book game, and uh, uh, is it game over? No, not game over. High score, uh, I think. High score, thank you. Yes, because there it's uh, it's told as over Thanksgiving they founded the company together. Yes, and it wasn't so. Thanksgiving either. So. Gotcha. Yet more oh, lies well. upon lies. <laughs> And another Epics related thing, you forgot the name of Mike Katz once again. Yeah, for some reason I blanked on it. It was just too much information all at once. 
Uh, so many mics. Yeah. Even yeah. even several cats's. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, what did you say about Secret of Nim, you swine? What did I you, say about it? You said that it was you. You said it was a poor movie, basically. Uh, the the plot makes no sense. How does it not make sense? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm sorry. The introduction of magic. What the frack? Why, yeah. Why is there suddenly a magic item? In this story, and how so it makes the science and magic, anyways. So that's it's not the, science I just, and magic. It's yes, it is the, the little amulet that a mouse can hold that will make her levitate. Yes, Where and it was made science? by the scientists. They very clearly explain this. So the scientists who, who were genetically altering were also making magic stones. It's like part of the. It's part of the genetic experiments that they are basically creating magic with it. That's so they changed the, the genetic makeup of a stone? No. <laughs> it's because ah, you do, you're purposely not getting it. No, Be gone, no, Carl. No, no. Or, the deal is it was not an element in the book. It made no sense, but Don Bluth insisted there had to be magic in it because that's how Walt would have done it. And as much as I love and admire Don Bluth, that's nonsense. And you're nonsense. Be gone with you, Carl. You I have been dismissed the from the Department of Corrections for July 1982. We'll see you next time for July 1992. See you then. Bye. Bye. So that Bradley training simulator actually had custom controls. Yeah, uh, you could activate multiple weapons, had a whole bunch of extra buttons, found pictures of it online. Apparently, there's only two units um, uh, known to have existed or are in existence. Okay. Any that that's, still work? Uh, I believe both of them still work. I know the ROMs have been nice. done. Yeah, uh, yeah. So they they are available now. There and this is a little bit. I didn't cover this in the uh, show notes for today, just because there's too much. But I did find an article where the army was talking about how they were in discussions with multiple video game manufacturers uh, to possibly contract for even more software and systems for training their soldiers but the big thing uh, the one comment they said was they did not know yet whether or not this kind of program would actually be useful in training on this equipment okay and so i think that that kind of killed it because you know how realistic could this hardware get to give you what you needed for this kind of training Yes, yeah. it would be cheaper, but would it really be effective? I'd love to see one of those and maybe play with one of those in real life. I mean, they, they fascinate oh, yeah. me. The, those, oh, yeah. Uh, with the, the bespoke huge controllers and many buttons and uh, trying to recreate some kind of real life setting, but using an old 8-bit computer probably or something like that, that, that just fascinates yeah. me. Yeah, me too. I mean, actually playing on one of those would be awesome. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, doesn't look like we're going to get the chance to do that in tech so Nah, probably not. Yeah. yeah. Oh well. Before we move on to yes. the, the actual news, there's a very, really important question I need to ask you. So my, my mind is is kind of boggling here. I, I I don't know what what to do because Ethan now is also a co-host sometimes. Yes. So so. What happens with the comment? Is he going to sing his own name? Does he correct himself? What's going on here? No. What we're going to be doing is the other co-hosts will have to decide on the Ethan comment. Ah, great. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, the Ethan comment uh, will be decided by you and Ooh. Chris and Wouter and Peter. So we'll have a little discussion in the Discord, uh, in our little Discord chat. And, but but uh, most importantly, who gets to sing his name then? Well, that is going to be up to you, Jets. Cause so it you're going to have to, to battle be... it out? Okay, okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It ain't going to be me because I like listeners. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't well, want to scare them away. <laughs> So, yes, I, I, I definitely I, I've got a, a, a whale of Ethan somewhere deep inside of me. I, I need to to get that out at some point. So 
then I'll, it, I'll I will there. gladly give you that uh, that <laughs> privilege. But uh, yeah, you guys have to listen to the episode and uh, write down some candidates mm-hmm. or some choices that you want to uh, offer up for that illustrious honor of being the inaugural Ethan Comet. Yes, yes. Mm. Cool. Sounds exciting. Sounds exciting. Oh, definitely. I'm looking forward to it. Mm. Okay. But that means it is time now. Yes. So turn on the time machine and head back to August of 1982. There is so much money to be made. Welcome to August of 1982. Mads, what's our first headline? Coin-ups come to grocery stores. Major supermarket heavyweights Safeway, Kroger, and A&P have either or are close to adopting coin-op video games in their stores. About half of the Safeway locations already have them as they are a quick moneymaker generating about $100 a week from a 50-50 split with the operators. Hmm. Yeah, funny. This I've never seen this in in any of the countries that I visited. Uh, I, this must be in the states, I guess. But oh yeah, uh, this is this is purely. I, I mean, of course, we had uh, we had coin op machines in chip shops and and so on, but uh, never seen them at a grocery store. Yeah, this was a very common sight for me as a kid. Yeah. Now, yeah, very common. I mean, I remember seeing these uh, all the way up through the early nineties. It makes sense. It makes perfect sense because uh, you drag your kids along and they don't actually want to to go out and shop with you. So you can yeah. just park them there at the arcade machines while you do your shopping, and then yeah. yeah and I mean, good. I remember probably must have been like eighty nine, ninety. You know, you'd go into a grocery store. Not not all of them had them, but if you, they did have one, it was never going to be the latest machine. You know, it'd be no. like. I remember playing a double dragon machine again, must've been 1990. So the game was really old at this point, but you know, there's nothing else to do. And it was either that or hang out at the magazine rack. And uh, so, yeah, the, this was the kind of thing that is proliferating in the U S at this point. I mean, it just kind of gives you this feeling of how big uh, this this market and the the obsession with coin op games has become. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. It's again, uh, we're, we're kind of heading towards the crash of arcade games. Uh, and so the fact that it's got to the supermarkets, you know, there's an oversaturation point coming. Yes. Yes. So the next piece of news is coin op hits some doldrums. According to this month's editorial in CoinOp Trade Magazine Replay, a deep summer dip in the market is really hurting all sides of the business, from operators to distributors to manufacturers. Operators are citing collection fall-offs of up to 35%. Distributors are stuck with already paid inventory, and one manufacturer allegedly has 7,000 brand new video game cabinets boxed and ready to ship with no buyers. Uh, they should just sell some of those to those grocery stores. <laughs> well, see, the, the grocery stores aren't buying the equipment. This is where the, the, the yeah, weird uh, thing with the operators bringing it mm-hmm. in and splitting the take is coming in. The problem is that uh, so uh, we've talked about it before. So many new operators have jumped onto the bandwagon. Yeah. Uh, so there's a flood of new operators who are desperate because they're buying these machines on credit. Uh, and the bigger context here is the United States is going through a really bad recession at this point. Yep. I don't know if it's already been declared a recession, but it, it, it is a recession. It's really bad economic downturn. So a lot of people are desperate to make a buck and uh, have gone into being operators and so there's an, just an overcrowded field of machines with most of them not earning that well. Most of the machines. Yeah, that's are, no good. Yeah, most of the machines just 
don't do very well or the average lifespan of the game is a couple of months. But, you know, you bought this thing, you're paying it off maybe over 12 months. And when and remember, you're splitting the take with the with the shop. So if after four weeks, the game isn't earning that much anymore, the shop is like, well, why should I continue to do business with you if you can't put a game in here that's going to earn? Mm. And so it's when I talked to Jim Trucano, the old AMOA president, he made the very common in the coin operator business joke that he's not in the coin operator business uh, business. He's in the furniture move, uh, moving business because they're constantly changing the position of these cabinets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the. Replay editor actually suggests that operators take advantage of bargaining opportunities and buy up a bunch of new games during this bear market uh, because the dip won't last. The dip will be over. Well, oh, yes, of course yeah, it will. Of course it will. Mm. I mean, you know, summer doldrums theoretically should be there, but actually summertime should be the time when the kids are out of school and blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, it. It's the yeah. beginning of a serious decline in the market. A serious, serious decline. I was just about to say, back in those di- days, uh, summer was when I played most video games because I had the time and I could uh, take my bike and go to the, the nearest chip shop or the sporting center where they had the arcade machines and played lots of arcade games. Whereas yeah. in the winter, when, it, when you didn't have your own computer at home, you wouldn't uh, get to play that much. And that's exactly the thing. Uh, there's... The economy's turned bad. The games are not as exciting. There's the, the big innovations aren't coming as quickly. People are getting bored of the games more quickly. And there's a lot more competition from other things like home video games suddenly. Yeah. We can, you know, they've been selling millions and millions of these consoles, you know. Mm. Little Johnny's got to figure out, do I play at home or do I play in the arcade? Uh, now, there is a glimmer of hope. The editor also goes on to proclaim that Tron will turn the public's view of coin op video games from a passing fad to part of wholesome family entertainment because it will be seen by so many and should generate, and this is a quote, generate a mountain of renewed interest in our product among the general public and quite possibly create a new player or two or a million. Mm. Yeah, uh, Tron is not going to do that well at the box office. No, and it is no. not going to become a <laughs> cultural touchstone. And uh, the Disney company is not having its best years at this point. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's one of those things. The fact that they're pinning out so many hopes on Tron, it's an exciting thing for them, of course. CoinOp has always seen themselves as a bit of a third-rate version of entertainment. Mm. And so, you know, getting the legitimacy by the big entertainment media like movies is seen as a step forward. But, uh, yeah, it's it's not going to have the effect that they're hoping for. And the downturn is going to continue for quite a long time because they just need to shake out all the operators who aren't making money. They need to shake out the uh, the manufacturers whose product just isn't up to snuff. They need to shake out a lot more of the gameplay mechanics in the games and make the games uh, have longer shelf lives or at least engage the players for more hours and so on and so forth. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, well. It's too bad they only had Tron. Had they had the beautiful movie that is Double Dragon, I'm sure the crash <laughs> wouldn't even have happened. Yeah, definitely not. Double Dragon definitely would have kept them all there. Uh, it would it would have made but but on, on to more news restrictions 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 everywhere oh yes the number of new local ordinances and laws and again we're talking about the united states at this point limiting coin op games is too numerous to count this month many raise the licensing fees on games to a point where they are unsustainable some limit the number of games per location or the zoning of the games one rural town banned the games altogether and in one town in new york state 
the many coin-op operators worked out a compromise with the city council to limit the number of games per location to just two, despite two operators being interested in opening arcades to just have Chuck E. Cheese himself show up unannounced at the council hearing, asking to be given an exception to the rule, promising to create 120 jobs and being a wholesome family type of place. So Chuck E. Cheese himself show up. Did, did somebody dress up? As that, yeah, yeah, uh, it was a guy mouse. in a Chuck E. Cheese outfit, together, of course, with a <laughs> spokesperson who was speaking yeah. for him. Beautiful. But the Chuck E. Cheese Beautiful. guy showed up. Oh. And, and okay, so it really is, I mean, literally, I probably counted at least four or five dozen uh, announcements of laws being passed or ordinances being passed this month. It was just crazy. Now. The uh, this town in New York, and I can't remember the name of it now. It's not really relevant. Uh, I don't know how it turned out. Uh, we don't have that result. Hopefully next month it'll show up in one of the uh, uh, trades. But the it gives us a very interesting insight into the business model at this point. So the operators who are the ones putting the machines in at 7-Elevens and gas stations and supermarkets and bowling alleys and restaurants and stuff, they they are small-time businesses. You know, they don't really care where they put the machines. They're also guys who are often in things like cigarette machines or pool tables and all these other coin-operated devices. Yeah. And, you know, they have this unsavory image and they can't they because they don't have any control over the venues and because they're scraping by, uh, even though this is a small town, but it sounds like they got at least a dozen operators in this town. They they can't they're having a hard time convincing the politicians and the concerned parents. And, yes, I said that with my eyes being rolled. Uh, yeah. They can't convince them that, you know, this is not a corrupting factor. And then here comes, you know, Chuck E. Cheese is like, you know, you don't really need to restrict it to two two machines per location. Just, you know, give me the permit to do this. Yeah. And uh, (laughs) this is the, the rise of the Family Entertainment Center is a whole new ball game. And it is really going to eat into these operators' operations. Um, Now, again, I don't know how this New York case went out, but in Bell, California, Chuck E. Cheese actually did get a special permit to open up a location, even though in that town uh, they had passed a rule setting a temporary moratorium on the creation of new arcades. So you got a town where they said no new arcades, but Chuck E. Cheese was able to get an exception basically on this idea of we're a family friendly place. We're not going to have the same problems as those arcades with those teenagers and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's yeah, it's it's a whole new idea. It's using the same equipment. It's appealing to largely the same demographic or at least a big chunk of the operator's demographic, but uh, it it doesn't have the same image problem as that demographic. Sounds corrupt and evil and stupid to me, but that's the U.S. for you. Uh, Yeah, yeah. uh, Basically, in a nutshell, it's we're afraid of anything that's going to bring down property values because we have no no social uh, safety net. And if our property values drop we could be living under in a box so yep yep but speaking of family entertainment centers we've got lots of news about that as well oh yeah castle park enters the family entertainment center fray with the success of showbiz and pizza time in the arena of pizza parlors cum arcade cum giant animatronic entertainers more companies are joining in Castle Entertainment, the parent company of which opened its first theme park in 1972, is now franchising its Castle Park Family Entertainment Centers named Tex Critters Pizza Jamboree. 
They currently have 12 locations featuring video games, animatronics, and food, and are franchising out the individual elements on a regional basis for full centers as well as local game rooms. Never heard about this. Uh, Castle Entertainment, are those the guys who, who made the, the movies as well? I mean, and no, that's Castle oh. Rock, I believe. Ah, that's Castle Rock. Okay. That's I think what I'm so. thinking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Never uh, heard about them. Me neither. Uh, and this is a thing that I never really experienced while in the States, mainly because I spent mo- too many years in Florida. But it is a big thing, especially in the Northeast, are these theme parks like big amusement yeah. parks yeah. that are only open during the spring, summer, and part of the fall. So because the weather is not good enough to be open in the winter, yeah. so there's seasonal parks. And there's a whole mess of these all over the U.S. I just ne- never even knew about it. I lived in Florida, so, you know, our theme parks were open all year round. Uh, and Castle Entertainment has – the Castle Park, that was the first one they opened. Apparently, they've got a franchise of them. I didn't do too much of a deep dive, but they're mainly mm-hmm. in the theme park uh, business. Okay. But now they're branching out into this. I did find some video. There's links to it in the show notes. Remember, everybody, everything we talk about here, there's links in the show notes Talk uh, that shows what uh, the Tex Critter look like. It was this southern... Uh, hillbilly themed show with a lizard or dragon as the main character uh, and yeah it's it's pretty terrible but <laughs> then again considering that the number one TV show is Dukes of Hazard at this point and mm-hmm. the number one selling line of toys is Dukes of Hazzard uh, even though again we've got more uh, Masters of the Universe toys keep showing up in more and more markets right now so that's that's going to unseat uh, uh, Dukes of Hazard fairly quickly. But that yeah. whole Southern hillbilly thing is very popular at this moment in the United States. OK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Castle Entertainment, that's the subsection of the company that's doing these Texas Critters uh, things. They will cease to exist in either 83 or 84. So the last year that I found a uh, financial reporting from them was in 83. OK, so they probably closed down in 84. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so they're not going to be long for this world. Mm. Oh, and uh, one other thing uh, in one of the magazines, Replay magazine, again, this the, this is a trade publication for coin op operators primarily. Eric, there's a guy named Eric Bombhard, and he's named operations manager for Tex Critters. And this is after he had been with Showbiz Pizza and later – and uh, after Showbiz, he had been in another one of these places that I'd never heard of before, and I can't find anything anywhere about it, called Sergeant Singer's Pizza Circus. Hmm. And I'm not making these names up, people. <laughs> so at least he, he tried a few other places that did the same stuff before. It, it, and this is all happening within the span of 24 months. Yeah. That there's all of these copycat places. I mean, you had the original uh, Pizza Time Theater. That's Chuck E. Cheese. And then Showbiz Pizza signed the deal with them. We talked about that last month with the lawsuit. And they basically copied them. And now we've just got one after the other after the other opening up. And it's really kind of scary. So if anybody knows how to get a hold of Eric Baumhart, since he seems to be the guy who who you went to back then if you wanted to start one of these places, I'd love yeah. to talk to him. <laughs> but I couldn't find him anywhere online. So, okay. So in even more family entertainment center news, Aladdin's Castle branches into food. The Pac-Man Palace in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is Aladdin Castle's first foray into the food arcade hybrid concept, serving up burgers, hot dogs, and fries. If the system works, they will look into opening even more. Kalamazoo is is a real name. That's a real name. That's a real name. Oh, wonderful. Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Pac-Man Palace, uh, uh, there's even a photo of the of the sign. It literally says Pac-Man Palace. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it's Aladdin's castle is known for arcades and shopping malls. You know, they were the first ones to have the clean arcade back in the 70s, you know, with an attendant there and making sure the kids don't eat and drink around the machines, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And this is now they're like, hey, you can make money off of arcades with food. Let's do this. Yeah. And I wonder if they, had the, uh, if, if they actually had the right to use the Pac-Man name. Uh, they must have, because they also have yeah. Pac-Man as a logo on there. Um, oh, okay. So okay. I believe, I don't know if a Lion's Castle does get bought up it later on, or is it already, it may already be part of Bally at this point. I, I mm-hmm. honestly can't remember. That's one so, of those things, the timeline, Ethan will have to tell me, because we've covered it here on the show before, but yeah. Okay, so speaking of, Bally goes high end with Tom Foolery. Yes, Bally's acquisition of Barabies, uh, Barabies or Barnabies, I can't remember, pizza restaurants in 1981, which we reported on in our August 1981 jump, has allowed them to jump into a new venture. Bally's Tom Foolery, a high end restaurant arcade experience serving not only pizza, but omelets, quiche, sandwiches, appetizers, and desserts. Each diner also receives a free game token to enjoy the latest in pinball and video game amusements in the game area. Four of the remodeled restaurants are already up and running with the hope of getting 15 to 20 more to be opened in 1982. So that menu doesn't sound uh, especially high end, I'd say, but uh, at least they had something different than just pizza. Well, and that's the thing. Uh, there's matchbooks. If you look online for Tom Foolery, there's a mm-hmm. few little products that have survived, like a couple of matchbooks and some of the tokens. And they've and the pi- pictures of what this place looked like on the inside, it does look a little high end. Now you have to remember, uh, eating out in the United States, and there's there's some interesting history. If anybody wants an insight on this, uh, I can recommend. Oh, name his name is eluding me. Famous American documentary maker. He did that famous one about the Civil War back in the day, but he did. Uh, a series about prohibition. It was on Netflix for quite a while. Uh, And I'll I'll link to it in the show notes. And in his, uh, this multi-part documentary about prohibition, he talks about the effect prohibition had on American dining culture. Because in restaurants, you don't make money off the food. Usually you make money off the drinks. And when you weren't allowed to sell alcohol anymore, That's what created what we now consider American dining culture, which is hamburgers and hot dogs and stuff. Because you now needed to make a food that was cheap enough where the profit margin would be sufficient to sustain the restaurant. Okay. And this is why even to this day, people will go to something like a TGI Fridays and order a burger, overpay for it. But that's still considered not high end but also it's not uncommon to order something like that in a higher end restaurant so the european definition of higher end is a completely different world from the american version of somewhat higher end simply because there's that break where for 10 years you couldn't do anything else then after prohibition you went into another 10 years of the, the depression then you come out of the depression into the baby boom in the suburbs where you don't have inner city restaurant culture anymore. Mm-hmm. And by the time it can finally come back, you've lost three generations of people who don't know any better. <laughs> okay. It, it really okay. is that kind of freaky thing. This is also mm-hmm. why so many restaurants don't serve alcohol. Like you can't order alcohol in a McDonald's, not necessarily because they don't want to sell it there. It's because getting the permit to sell alcohol in a restaurant is so complicated and so expensive in the United States and most places that it wouldn't even pay off. Okay. Yeah, it's totally weird from a European standpoint. And also why if if you've seen the movie Pulp Fiction, there's that scene where they're in the car 
and it's uh, John Travolta and Samuel Jackson talking about uh, uh, about Sam uh, about Holland and what it's like in Amsterdam. He's like, you go into a McDonald's, you can get a real beer and a real glass. Yeah. And that's just yeah. this shocking thing to Samuel Jackson's character because it would be unthinkable in the United States, but it doesn't have to do with it has to do with that morality issue, but it's still the legal structural side effects of prohibition are still there. Okay. Yeah. Weird. Sorry. I could yeah. go off on, for a while on this, but that's not really the topic we're here for today. So I apologize to everybody for that detour. And let us please continue to our next wonderful topic. Beefsteak Charlie's tries games. Yeah, Beefsteak Charlie. Got to love that name. Uh, New York all-you-can-eat chain Beefsteak Charlie's has decided to experiment with adding games to its restaurants. A location in Manhattan has had nine machines added to the restaurant, all set to free play to avoid violating the local arcade bans. If it's successful, they may expand to other locations. Ah, that's clever. Free play means that it's no longer coin-operated. Exactly. Ah, clever. <laughs> yeah. Now, granted, are you going to make any money off of it? No. And, well, uh, you're probably going to get some attraction. more people in. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Especially since they've banned, which, and I apologize to everybody. Uh, normally, I try to build the transitions a little bit better. We have so many stories to cover. Uh, we're going to be coming back to this question of the ban in New York City a little bit later when we get into the the straight up legal news. We did the the restrictions a little bit, but we will have to come back to this topic again. But I put all the legal news at the very end of the show or close to the end of the show today. So keep that in mind. It's a ban on arcades in New York. We'll talk about that. Oh, wait, I already did that in the headlines. Oh, well, let's (laughs) keep going. So diving into consoles, Summer CES sees massive video game presence. While over 1,000 companies were showing their wares at the summer CES, over 30 of them were introducing video game products. While most were showing off VCS-compatible games, the looming Atari 5200 and its incompatibility with the VCS has led Atari to announce a converter to allow the play of older VCS carts in 1983. So they'd uh, add a cart that you could put another card into that would actually read the 2600 game? Basically. And since the hardware's basically completely different, and mm. I don't even know if this converter ever actually came out, but it would mm. probably have to be similar to the converter for the ColecoVision, which yeah. was just an Atari 2600 on a chip. Yeah, yeah. Or simplified so- down, yeah. So I, I have a, an Atari 7800 and that reads the, uh, the the 2600 cards. So uh, at least they learned. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this, if I remember correctly, the 7200 is very similar to the Atari 8 bits. Mm. So they're both sharing the same CPU of uh, 60, uh, 6502. Okay, if memory right. serves me right. Mm, could and be. Let me just do a quick check. Atari 7200. 7800, right? 7800, you're right. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, home video game system. Backward compatibility. It's using a... No, it's it's using an Atari custom chip. Mm. Uh, but yeah, but it was backward compatible. Yeah, it was. It was. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have no idea. So, uh, oh, okay. No, it's a custom variant of the six five zero two. So yes, it okay. is a six five zero two system at heart. That's why yeah. I can do the backwards compatibility. Mm. Okay. Ha ha. Ha. To it now. <laughs> So Playthings Magazine editor tells toy retailers to jump on video game bandwagon. 
This month's editorial in Play Things Magazine, a trade publication for toy retailers, is advising toy retailers to not let video games slip them by. Yes, he acknowledges that many retailers are hesitant about carrying video games, afraid they'll be left with unsold inventory the same way they were after electronic games passed their prime. But, he argues, this time is different because, quote, video game addicts, end quote, need a constant flow of new software, and the massive number of new companies entering the market means that they will always be coming back to buy more games. So in hindsight, this is epic bad timing. Uh, this is epic dumbassery. <laughs> <laughs> because the idea that history can't repeat itself because these people are addicts and we're yep. just going to sell them <laughs> drugs. Yes. Uh, they said the same thing about electronic games. They said, oh, these people love these games so much they can't, can't stop buying the new ones. They need to have more and more. And the fact that there's so many people making games it, that the quality doesn't matter. They just need another fix. They're going to come in and buy that next $40 cartridge. No, they're not. Oh, they'll keep coming in. They'll keep buying the games, but they'll be buying them out of your $5 or $0.50 cent, uh, uh, d uh, discount rack. Yeah, so, bargain bins. Yep. Yeah. Now, interesting enough, uh, in the same magazine, several industry insiders, two retailers and three manufacturers, sound off on the likelihood of a crash come Christmas. Friend of the show, Michael Katz, sees quality of software and system expandability being key to keeping the market growing and consumer interest high, while Al Kassler, owner of Kassler Incorporated, sees the same trends that left retailers holding the bag after the electronic game market got flooded happening again. Now, uh, Kassler Inc. is, I believe, a they own a chain of uh, toy stores. Now... Okay. Richard Stearns of Parker Brothers, uh, the, the guys who have been licensing stuff like Star Wars for their VCS games, sees the hardware market hitting saturation within the next year or two, but the software market as open-ended. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Kessler's opinion here is really on the money. You know, yeah. it's uh, – and Michael Katz's as well. Because he's he says, you know, it's about the quality and the and the Stearns guy from Parker Brothers, he's kind of right as well that, you know, people will stop buying the hardware because you know, they've got the hardware. In theory, the software market could have been open ended as long as you kept making better games. Mm. Uh, but the problem is that there's no control on who can make the games. It's it's an open market. And yes. yeah, that's it's just going to be a problem. So we are heading face first into the crash. Yep. Okay. So Atari slashes price of the 5200. In preparation for their next generation console, Atari has slashed the wholesale price of the 5200 to just $185, more than $100 less than originally intended. Retail prices could go as low as $219. Hmm. So it's not even out yet. Yeah, that's impressive. Were they selling this at a loss or... Well, they haven't started selling it yet. Um, they're oh, taking oh. orders at CES, mm. but they've had to reduce the price because the ColecoVision is – I. this is my speculation here. I think the ColecoVision just spooked them. Okay. Spooked them really, Good. really bad mm. because they've they've been hyping up the 5200 for at least a year and a half at this point. Uh, you know, that their super system, as it's being called in a lot of the magazines, was just going to, you know, take the world by storm. Because I think they thought the Intellivision was the machine to beat. And suddenly Coleco, the, the guys doing handheld games, have come out of nowhere with their ColecoVision. Because they hadn't really been touting it. it, it I mean, they mentioned it six months earlier, but they didn't really hang it hang up high hey we're doing this and the fact that you know it's packed in with donkey kong 
And most of the initial 5200 lineup is just ports of 2600 arcade games. Yeah. It's going to make it look a good cool. version of Donkey Kong. And that's the thing. And mm. it's it's basically a, going to be a better system and it's not going to have those it's it's not going to have a great controller, but it's not going to be the broken piece of crap that is the 5200 controller. So No. Okay. Yeah. Um so they're dropping the price even before it comes out, and this uh, and it's probably also a little bit of reaction to companies like Commodore, uh, and we're going to talk about it in the computer section. The price wars are now on in a yeah. big, big bad way. Yeah, and, and and television is there as well. And television offers a fifty dollar rebate. Mattel is offering a $50 cash refund for purchasers of the Intellivision between August 16th and September 18th. So what's the difference between having a cash refund and just lowering the price, $50? Well, remember, if you lower the price, you're that's fine as the manufacturers say, oh, now it's lower. Well, you'd have to get buy-in from the retailers. So the retailers are buying it at a wholesale price is what we talked about with the 5200. Now the retailers can put whatever price they want on it. The retailer wants to sell it for no profit. Fine. They sell it for no profit. Uh, They sell it at the wholesale price. Or they can add an extra price on top. That's why in the 5200 article I wrote that it could go as low as. And you see this. Mm quite a bit in the magazines at the, and these trade publications, especially play things where, you know, they'll be talking about it in different regions, you know, what toys cost. And they'll be like, yeah. And this toy is going from anywhere between $4 and five fifty, And you're like, wow, that's, that's a pretty steep difference, but depends on the toy store that's carrying it. You know, if you're in a ritzier part of town, you might charge more. If you're in yeah. a mall yeah. with higher r- rent, you might charge more. And so there is there's a standardized price for the wholesale uh, price, but not for the retail prices. OK. And if Mattel wants to make this change quickly, they could change the wholesale price. But what happens to the guy who put in his order six months ago? Mm. You know, you he's still basically under contract to buy it for a certain price. It becomes this nightmare. So instead, you People still pay the same price at the retail outlet, and Mattel will send them the 50 bucks, and the retailer still gets to pocket the profit margin that they originally anticipated pocketing. Yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it, it really becomes weird. And this is also before – I mean, Toys R Us is there, and we will be talking about them today, but – most most of the business is still running through these small mom and pop or small small regional chains with just a handful of stores. Mm. So it's not the it's not the world we know today, where even in Europe most retail is done by a handful of big companies. Okay. So moving on to the next piece of news, Atari gets ET rights. We reported last month that Atari had signed a deal with Steven Spielberg for his movies, but now the rights to E.T., which were with Universal, have been locked down for both home and arcade games. Oh, joy. Yeah, yeah. Now, (laughs) granted, I still wonder if they ever did any work on an arcade game, if that was even Mm -hmm. beat about, because that would have been fun. I've only played the 2600 game. Yeah, that's the only one that comes out of this time period. There yeah. are ET games that come later, much, much later, but out of this period, that is the ET game. Okay. And, and the. Yeah. Sorry? It's bad. Oh, it is. It is very bad, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also made on a, on the, a very, very uh, strict time schedule. I mean, it was uh, to be delivered in. What do you have? Five, six weeks, so like that. You yeah, well, correct, correct uh, us here. I, I, I mean, forget. This, I read that story years this ago. This news is coming out in the New York Times, so it's we're not getting this massive magazine delay. I mean, they might be getting it a week or two later, depending on when the press release came out. 
but it's not taking that long. It's got to be ready for Christmas. Mm. And the news is breaking in August. So you okay. know it's crunch time because they still have to manufacture the cartridges. Yes, yes. And then ship them out to the retailers. Yeah, so it needs to be yeah. there quite a, quite a lot of time before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But speaking of Donkey Kong on Coleco, Coleco recalls Donkey Kong carts. Due to a modification in newer models of the VCS from the original, Coleco's Donkey Kong cartridge for the VCS won't work on original VCSs. While this will only affect a small portion of users as most VCSs have been sold since the modification, Coleco has decided to recall tens of thousands of the cartridges to make the necessary modifications to avoid having angry customers bringing them back to the stores. Mm. So, so this this VCS cartridge wouldn't work on the first versions of the VCS, of the, VCS. The, the the wood the woodies. Well, uh, you were still dealing with the woodies at this point, but there's apparently okay. two different models of the woodies. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's some I've never heard about this change. Before. Yeah, okay. I didn't know about it either, and apparently it doesn't affect virtually any of the games, but it had an effect on this one for some reason. Mm. So okay. yeah, uh, yeah, it sounds like a bad case for them to have. So yeah, probably a good idea to recall them. Yeah, I mean, and uh, so they recall them. It's going to cost them a bit, but you know, hey, uh, better than uh, getting a bad reputation, especially as Coleco has just now entered yeah. the CS market. Yeah, of course. So next piece of news: Arcadia wants to supercharge the VCS. Arcadia Corporation introduced the supercharger at CES. This add-on gives the VCS six kilobi- uh, kilobits, no, kilobytes, it's got to be kilobytes, mm-hmm. of memory, a bump up from the system's 128 bytes, and loads games from cassette tape. Mm, never seen this one before. Uh, so I, I, I wonder how many games were released for that. Uh, not a whole heck of a lot. Have you ever heard of? I think it's communist uh, uh, um, uh, communist invaders from Mars or something along those lines. No, no. I okay, it's it's like it's it's if it's just one of those games that everybody bandies around as you know the prototypical early '80s Reagan era game. Uh, mm. It's just a shooter, not really anything to write home about, but. Uh, yeah, so the idea with the supercharger is that instead of using cartridges, you're going to use cassette tapes to load the games. Yeah. And you're adding in essentially the memory that you would need for loading that software that would normally be on the cartridge. You load it into the into the memory <coughs> of this thing, and then you're playing. So this, this is what this game is. Mm. And... Um, uh, so, so what the supercharger just does is it gives uh, gives it enough memory to load a game into memory, so you yeah. can make games on cassette, lowering obviously the cost of manufacturing dramatically. Yeah, yeah, it makes makes complete sense. Uh, it doesn't make the uh, VCS any stronger as as such then, because it's just a ROM that's being replaced with some RAM there. But uh, it makes sense to make the, uh, the the distribution a lot cheaper. Well, it makes the distribution a lot cheaper, but also you have to remember VCS cards, the lack of memory, that 128 bytes that you have, even though you can load stuff constantly off of the cartridge, mm. once you have a lot more memory to work with, you can do much more impressive games in theory. Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, you can have more detailed rooms and more detail on the. Uh, I mean, basically, you can start loading actual graphics and stuff into this. Uh, it's that memory restriction was really restrictive. I guess it depends on how you use the cassette tape. I mean, if you can actually stream data from the cassette tape, yes, you could use the the full, well, not the full, but a lot of those six kilobytes of memory for the game uh, itself. But if you need to load in everything that would normally be on ROM and store it in memory and then run from there, I guess you wouldn't get that much extra, would you? Well, how large was its standard Atari 2600 cartridge? I've got no idea. 
Ah, see, this is the fun part. So let's open up one of these ROMs. Let's mm. go with uh, the classic, let's say Pitfall. So Pitfall, which is probably one of the most technologically complex games, came on a 4K ROM. That is impressive. I mean, I love that game. How yeah. could that be 4K? Of very simple. I mean, uh, you only have a couple of sprites that you're constantly switching out between yeah. scan lines. Uh, they're essentially monochromatic because you're not storing them as a sprite. What you're doing is you're saying, well, in this scan line, the sprite is two pixels wide. In the next one, it's one pixel wide. And you're changing the color values of that sprite mm -hmm. as you go along to suddenly make him into a little man. Yeah. Uh, Impressive. So this, Impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And. And so this is why, I mean, that was a 4K ROM, uh, let's see, Hero, which would be another good yep, one to another look at. Game. Great game. Uh, that's, that's an 8K ROM. Mm. So, but that comes out in 1984. That's already a couple years later. So yep. in theory, the Supercharger in 1982 is similar to what the Famicom disk system later will be. Yes. Yeah. So at the time of introduction, it's a massive amount of new storage space. I don't know if this could do save states to cassette or something, but in theory, that would, if that was possible, that would be really cool. But yeah, yeah. as cartridges get bigger, this is going to be surpassed. Okay. Yeah. And it's also going to be similar to the problem that things like the Sega channel. Um, are going to have later the that was a Genesis cartridge and the Intellivision cartridge has a similar problem. So that um, online system where you plug it into the cable channel and you could download Intellivision games. Yes, they could only be as large as the built-in memory in the uh, in the hardware. Mm, and later Intellivision games or very quickly actually the Intellivision games get too large to download into that so you could only get the more primitive in television games not the more advanced ones that came later mm. yeah it makes so, sense yeah they need, um, they need even more RAM. Then. and that's the thing ram is even more expensive than rom yeah so 6k at this point would probably be the maximum they could afford to put into a device and still be commercially viable at this point yeah could be could yeah but it's an interesting okay. little moment because, you know, it, it is bringing in that question of price of media versus, you know, versatility of that media. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, the, the UK is going to fight with all the way up until the early 90s with the whole micros using cassette tapes. Yes. While the rest of the world switched to discs. Exactly. In the 70s. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you and I in, in, in Germany and Denmark, we were all about the discs most, most yeah. of the time on the C64 as well. So. Exactly. But, you know, it's because we didn't have the ZX Spectrum and the Amstrad uh, to sort of make normalize the cassette business. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. in Spain, for example, where the Spectrum and the Amstrad also had big presences, the C64 was relegated to cassette as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as you had a popular system that was using cassette, it just becomes the de facto, this is the medium so that those carrying games in those multiple formats didn't have to carry two different size packages. Yes. Damn you, retail. Damn you to hell. <laughs> okay, sorry. It's all retail's fault, really, is what I'm trying to say here. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So Philips announces Odyssey 3. At a press event in April, Philips introduced not only a slew of new games for the Odyssey 2, hyped a speech synthesizer unit for it, and a new ad campaign, but that mid-1983, a follow-up console that would be backward compatible with the Odyssey 2 through an add-on would be hitting the market to help make Odyssey a worldwide known brand. Yeah, that's not going to happen. No, 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 this is not going to happen. This has Snowball's chance in hell of happening. <laughs> so next piece of news, PDI yeah. announces console games. 
Program Design Incorporated, maker of Atari 8-bit software, has announced that they will be joining the growing mass of 2,600 game makers with two kid-friendly games, The Adventures of Oswald and Oswald's Golden Key. Mm, Both games that I don't know. And because they never saw the light of day. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is another company... Uh, similar to so many that we've already talked about, like um, uh, Sierra, and well, Sierra gets it doesn't get into the 2600 directly, but so many of the companies we've seen that were in the computer space get enticed to get into cartridge uh, cartridges. Uh, these guys fortunately never make it to that point, so these games never get released, uh, okay. and they stick with home computers. Uh, but you know the last releases from them on Moby Games are dated '83, so they're mm. not going to last much longer. It's very possible because there's a couple companies this happens to that the the move into uh, the cartridges, developing the games, buying systems to develop them on, maybe even manufacturing some cartridges, but never being able to get them out to stores is such a big cash outlay for these very, very small companies, really, that it just breaks them and they cease yeah. to exist. Okay. Hmm. So even more uh, companies that will cease to exist very soon. Come of it joins the VCS card free. And yet another company jumps into VCS game making. Founded by three PhDs, the company would be gone with the crash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Lucasfilm okay. enters the VCS market as well. Oh, yeah. Lucasfilm has signed a deal with Atari to develop and market video games. This news comes on the heels of 20th Century Fox, MCA, and Paramount, all starting video game divisions. So Lucasfilm, at least, they, they didn't uh, suffer that much in the crash because they went on for many, many years afterwards. Well, they also had the rest of Lucasfilm keeping them afloat, but yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. Yeah, their their big thing is, I don't think they actually get around. I mean, they're signing the deal at this point, and remember, the Star Wars licenses over at uh, Parker Brothers, the Raiders of the Lost Ark license is already at Atari. Lucasfilm doesn't really have anything else at this point. Okay, so. From this deal, as far as I can tell, this is the deal that leads to the Star Wars arcade games. Yeah. Star Wars Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Mm. And uh, this is also uh, the deal that's going to lead to Atari developing a whole bunch of games that end up being Atari 8-bit machine games originally, like Eidolon and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, they get ported to the C64 and other systems, but it starts out with uh, the Atari 8-bit systems. Mm. Yeah, but at least they, they kept the flow also, I guess, because they stuck. Their, their main market was always, always the, the microcomputers, the, the PCs, right? Yeah. Now, had the crash not happened, I'm sure they would have tried to output stuff for the for the consoles, especially the yeah. 5200. It'd be. But uh, it's, you know, they're signing this deal now. By the time they would have gotten games up and running, the crash is already uh, is already taking care of that. OK. okay. Yeah. So next piece of news is that CBS to distribute ColecoVision internally. International. Oh, sorry. Internationally. Yes. <laughs> internally. I didn't wonder what internally yeah. would mean here. Hmm. (laughs) Uh, CBS Inc., a subdivision of media giant CBS Columbia, has acquired the international distribution rights to the ColecoVision and Coleco's line of cartridges for the system in the entire world except for the USA, Canada, and Japan. The distribution will happen through CBS's Music Distribution Network and Ideal Toy, which it recently signed a letter of intent to acquire. Coleco will also gain the right to release games based on Bally Arcade games through CBS's license to the same. Hmm. So I wonder how much sales they made with this, because I don't remember ever seeing the ColecoVision anywhere, actually. Uh, 
It does get distribution in Europe, but yeah. not great distribution. You also have to remember, okay. at this point in time, game consoles just aren't that big of a deal. And you also have other issues. Like in Europe, every single country seems to have its own electrical socket. Yes. Every single country has its own regulations on RF. Every single country is do uh, ha, uh there no there is I think there's a unified television standard at this point. That's the okay. one thing that's unified. We've but, got the PAL standard. Yeah. Mm. But you have sorry. You have in Europe uh you've got a change the marketing languages you've got to get all of your ducks lined up on how to even market this it's europe is just a few years behind the united states in almost all of these attributes and europe especially the big important countries like for example germany don't necessarily have the same coin-op culture of video games that are targeted at kids that you have in the United States because you have legalized gambling and that's the focus of coin up. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the exposure to a game like Donkey Kong, for example, isn't there on a mass scale, which means the packing game doesn't mean anything to anybody. No, that's probably true. Never yeah. consider that. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So, I mean, it, it you'd have to introduce the product to these people completely fresh, and mm. it's going to have an appeal. I mean, I've seen some retro gamers with these systems over here, but they're few and far between. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Okay, counterfeiting hits home market. The International Trade Commission in the USA plans to issue an order that will exclude pirated Pac-Man games from entry into American ports. The commission will require importers to post bonds equaling 54% of the price they pay for assembled games and 300% of the price they pay for unassembled components. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, trying, trying to get the, the gray market away? Yeah, well, we've talked already quite a bit about uh, the big problem that uh, pirated arcade boards are representing at this point and how they've been trying to uh, close out those imports. But this is the first notice that I've seen where they're going after cartridge games for the hull. Okay. And uh, obviously, you know, it's it is a different market because the individual boards are not as pricey as the arcade games. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they're much cheaper to manufacture. They're much smaller. And if you can get these into the pipeline fast enough, I mean, there's so many Pac-Man cartridges that you could potentially sell mm. and people would be willing to buy them at bargain basic prices mm -hmm. this could become a real real issue so speaking of a field where piracy could never possibly happen let's move to computers <laughs> computers <laughs> so ti heats up price war Texas Instruments has decided to go all in on the home computer price war, announcing a $100 mail-in rebate for purchasers of ti 99 a machines. The machines retail for just $299, and the rebate will run through the Christmas season. So here we go with the rebate again, just to uh, sidestep the, the problem of the retailers. It's mm -hmm. to make it fast. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, so uh, these announcements are coming out of CES again, uh, or coming right after CES when everybody's shown their products, and yeah. TI realizes the VIC-20 is eating their lunch. Yeah, okay. And uh, they need to do something to get into the same price category as the $200 VIC-20. Yeah, and they did. He went yeah, down they to did. 199. They did. Uh, and Jack Trammell is not going to take that sitting, uh, lying down. The price nope. war is on. 
Yes, uh. and the Texas <laughs> Instruments are not the only ones to be dropping prices because Atari announces a $50 price cut at CEF. Atari announced a $50 cut in the list price of the Atari 400 at CES from $399 to $349. Mm, but still quite expensive, eh? A very expensive, especially for the 400. This is the one without a proper keyboard. And I tried the 400. I, I have an 800, which is actually a really nice machine. Uh, oh, yeah. When you consider how old it is. Yeah, I mean it's a, a 19 what 79 machine or 78? Mm. I can't remember. Yeah. 79, I think. Yeah, because we covered the release of it on the show, and uh, it's it, it's just the Atari 8-bit computers are really really great. The graphics are amazing. It's J Minor doing what J Minor does best, making great mm. graphic hardware. But uh, Atari just hasn't been able to get the prices down. Uh, but also remember, Atari doesn't have the vertically integrated manufacturing that TI and Commodore have. So oh. Commodore owns MOS technology. They can make all the chips in-house. TI is Texas Instruments. They can make all the chips they want. Atari still has to buy the components from the outside. Yeah. And that is preventing them from getting certain economies of scale here. Yeah, it yeah. makes total sense, of course. Of course. So Tandy closes out the 4K Coco. Faced with increasing competition, Tandy's Radio Shack has closed out their inventory of 4K TRS-80 color computers by reducing them from $399 to $299 while introducing a new 16K model at $399. Mm, okay, so so still joining in on the price wars here, but uh, kind of kind of more expensive still for the Trash-80. Uh, still more expensive for the Trash 80. Uh, again, no proper keyboard. This is really where the VIC-20 is killing yes. everybody. Mm. It's yeah. the fact that, you know, you're getting this cheap computer, it's being advertised as a game system, and it's got a real keyboard with real springs in it, which is, and it's hard to imagine nowadays how, what a big deal that is. Yeah, but it it is the thing that makes it look like a real machine and not a toy. Yeah, definitely, and it's got yeah. Captain Kirk as well. You can't underestimate the value of those Captain Kirk ads. They're so <laughs> good. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Good oh, well. Shatner. You gotta look. Okay. Yeah. Toys R Us begins to carry computers. Compute Magazine heralds the beginning of true mass market computing with the arrival of home computers at toy mega retailer Toys R Us. The chain already carries Commodore's VIC-20 and TI's 994A and will, according to rumor, soon carry Atari's 8-bit computers as well. While the beginner consumer may not get the help normally associated with a specialty retailer, the accessibility will no doubt help propel adoption in ways heretofore unseen. Yeah, this, this is a huge step, isn't it? I mean, this is where computers become so easy to use that you don't need uh, an expert seller that can tell you how to use them and, and what you actually gain from them. Because now you just turn them on. There's a basic problem. Everybody knows how to, to get something loaded and then you go from there. Uh, yeah, it's it's the dawn of I don't buy a computer to write software I need. I buy the computer to run the software I want that already exists. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the move away from the hobbyist market and into the mass market. Exactly. And there's nothing more mass market than Toys R Us. Mm. And it's also this acknowledgement that these computers are no longer just <clears throat> monochrome text on a screen like the TRS-80, the original one was, or the Commodore PET, it, these are now machines that can put colors on the screen. They can play video games, which, as we've seen, is the big thing. And people are still talking about, you know, you buy the game console because it's the stepping stone to the computer. It's the next step. It's also why yeah. Commodore is introducing the, um, the Commodore Max which is a C64, but with virtually no RAM and no real keyboard that is supposed to, you know, make you want to leapfrog to the C64. Yeah. So 
Yeah, no, it's this is a pivotal moment. I remember as a kid walking into Toys R Us and in the very front, they had, you know, this walled off section where all the video games were. Uh, and you had to actually talk to an attendant and they pull out the, the video games from behind glass doors for you. Mm. And but then they also had this whole row where it was just uh, these little flaps that you could flip back and forth with the cover of a game. And on the back was the description of the game, things like Gauntlet and stuff, but all for the Atari 8-bit, the C64, and so forth. And if you looked above, you actually saw the computers, and you could buy the computers there as well. Yeah. And, you know, for a lot of people who, especially with American suburbs the way they are set up, finding a computer store is very, very hard at this point still. Uh, Finding a place that, you know, you can actually get to to look at the stuff is very difficult and the kind of inventory a Toys R Us can carry the number of games on their shelves is going to beat every mom and pop shop out there. Yeah. So, yeah. Of course. Yeah. It's, it's this, this is when we actually have a mass market computer industry and home computers become commodities. Yeah. Yeah, interesting times. Very. So everyone wants to make it to retail. With an onslaught of low-priced computers from TI, Commodore, NEC, Atari, and Timex coming, the race is on to lay claim to the valuable shelf space at mass market retailers like JCPenney, Montgomery Ward, Kmart, and Sears. Traditional computer stores have mostly abandoned these cheaper machines to concentrate on more high-end and thus more training and support required machines like the IBM PC. The mass market retailers know they won't make much on computer sales, but are hoping that software and peripheral sales will make computers a razor slash razor blade business model. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense, of course, for them. Yeah. And And I'm guessing that actually was a success for them. Yeah, I mean, Kmart um, is very quickly going to adopt this. Sears is going to adopt this. Sears already has their business centers that they've been opening in different stores. So these are little side stores next to the normal Sears uh, department store that is selling mainly business machines. But they're going to open up these sections inside the store, usually not tremendously big, but, you know, a couple of display units, a bunch of software and those will be, you know, places where you can go and buy stuff for your home computer. Mm. Uh, and J.C. Penney, as far as I know, never really gets too deep into this, at least not post crash. Uh, they will sell stuff in their catalogs, but not in the stores themselves. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, it, I mean, this is just going to become one of these. You have, you know, some computers you can buy. Go into the store, you know, the same one that you bought some sneakers in, maybe a a, a paperback novel, and also take home a C64. Yeah. yeah. But you could also take home a piece of crap because Timex launches souped up Celex 81. Crap. It's 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 a, it's a machine of its time. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> but compared to the other machines of the same time, it's yeah, not yeah, something yeah. special. Yeah. Yes. It was something special when Sinclair launched it, but that was early on. Yeah, this is a year later, uh mm. a, a year late and a dollar short. Yes. So time and 2K ex- short at least. <laughs> well, it's slightly better than it was before. So uh, mm. Timex, the watchmaker that has been manufacturing Sinclair's computers in the UK, will be launching a souped up version of the ZX81, the Timex Sinclair 1000 in the USA with 2K versus the original's 1K of memory. Its price tag of of just $99 may make it a de facto winner in the upcoming price war. Still with the chiclet uh, keyboard? Oh, yes, of course. They're yeah, not upgrading yes. that. No, no. Yeah. But the price tag is right. I mean, $100, that's, that's cheap. Yeah, but I mean, 
you get a lot more than double that for doubling your money with a VIG-20, you know? Yes. Yes, that was my, my point with calling it a piece of shit. Yeah, it, it, it is a piece <laughs> of shit. Okay, I'll give you yes. that. Um, it, it it's just has too many drawbacks to be... It, it has too many drawbacks. By the time you buy all the extra peripherals to make it a usable system, like a memory mm. expansion, a real keyboard, and so forth, could have just gone ahead and bought the real thing. Yes. But hey, it's a computer for under a hundred bucks, and that sort of sends the message. It, it, it's going to at least send a message to some consumers: prices are dropping. Maybe I mm-hmm. need to wait a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah. So moving on, Sony introduces the SMC70. Sony has finally pulled the trigger on their entry into microcomputing. The SMC70 is a Z80A-based machine with 64K of RAM, 16 colors, a Sony-made version of BASIC, and the CPM operating system. The biggest innovation is the inclusion of a connector for a video disc player and supports Sony's recently introduced 3.5-inch disc format. Now that sounds like a beast of a machine. It sounds like a beast of the machine, except you look at the Z80A. Yeah, yeah. That's it's like <laughs> I oh, mean, 64 man. key of RAM, 16 colors, and and uh, support for video disc. Yeah, and this even is the three, what uh, we've been three and a half inch discs. Yeah, see, this is the thing. You've got the three and a half inch floppy. You've got the video disc player. So, uh, from what I've seen, this was primary really targeting things like educational facilities because of the video disc option of being able yeah. to pull up, you know, have access to a massive amount of data that you can pull up. Uh, obviously, it's not something that's going to catch on. Uh, it's, nope. you know, the manufacturing of the discs, you know, getting information out there onto the disc is going to be the bottleneck in the system. Mm. If you had a cheap way of burning them, fine or but there's just you know just not enough software to support that function but it is interesting to see that sony is in the game because this is something that's been going on for at least a year two years almost in the magazines in the u.s everybody's afraid of what happens when the japanese show up will it be calculators all over again where the prices just drop and everybody's screwed and Sony is the big bad boogeyman because they were the ones who had crippled, if not outright killed, American television manufacturing with their Trinitron uh, okay. technology. Yeah. So, and Sony, of course, I believe the Walkman is already introduced at this point, maybe coming hmm. next year. I can't remember. But Sony is just considered like, if anybody's going to kill us, it's going to be Sony. Okay. And so Sony coming in with this machine, I think a lot of people are breathing a sigh of relief. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but this machine is also sort of a, a, I think from the little bit I read about it, it's it's an a- object lesson in the downsides of compromise. So there's an add-on for it that allows you to produce kanji, which means that you have a resolution on here that would also allow for, you know, kanji, which means that you probably could have maybe done more colors, lower resolution, and still would have been usable for the West, things like that. So there's there's compromises going on in this system. Uh, They also wanted CPM on there, which means that you have to have a Z80 processor. Hmm. because CPM really doesn't work on anything other than a Z80 processor properly. Uh, instead of going with, you know, a higher end processor and so forth. So there are compromises in this system. Okay. Yeah. So moving on to something that's all American then. IBM PC sales expected to rise. IBM expects to sell close to 1 million IBM PCs by the end of 1984, based on disclosures of disk contracts being signed by Big Blue. They have also hired an additional 500 people at their Boca Raton, Florida facility, which assembles the PC. So how many did they actually end up selling? 
That I honestly yeah, the don't know. No. I don't have those numbers. Uh, I know that they're the one million thing uh, is not. I don't think they reached the one million in 1984, but I could be wrong there. These uh, are these are priced completely differently from the the other machines we've just been talking about. I mean, oh yeah, these would be thousands of dollars, wouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, now granted, the Sony, uh, the SMC70 has a base price of, if I remember correctly, about seven hundred and fifty dollars. But okay. once you add in the extra disk drives and all that stuff, it it's a two thousand dollar machine that you're buying. <laughs> okay. But I mean, granted, the C64. Remember, when we're talking about the the trash um, 80 Coco, when we're talking about the VIC-20, when we're talking about all these machines, they're all coming without any disk drives or, or monitors. So all of those low prices still come out fairly high. I mean, the $500 or so C64 was always being calculated as a $1,000 machine. Because you okay. needed a disk drive, you needed a printer, you needed a screen. By the time you bought all those extras, you were at a thousand bucks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's just that base computer, and this is also where Jack Tramiel is going to be able to um, wipe out TI. Ultimately, they're going to drop the price of the 99.4 so much by early '83, uh, or I think it's '83 or '84 that they're losing about a hundred dollars per machine oh and but they're making it up in the peripherals mm. and so what jack does is he doesn't drop the price of the vic 20 or the c64 at that point he just drops the price of all the commodore's peripherals okay and ti basically and this is happening at ces you know ti announces a price cut he announces a price cut by the end of uh ces TI is announcer out of the business. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but th- that's something that's still coming in the future. Mm, okay. uh, that's going to be the end of the price war. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's one of those situations where uh, IBM is just playing a completely different game. They're not, yeah. you know, they're not going for the mass market. They know. Business people are going to buy this. If people buy it for the home later on, that's fine as well. And their definition, practically, of the personal computer is not a home computer. It is a computer run uh, being manipulated and used by a single person as -hmm. opposed to a networked machine that many people are sharing time on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. At, At this point in time, they'd be selling the 8088. Uh, this is the 8088. Oh, no, or, or is it already the 8080? No, it's the 8088, I think. It has to be 8088. At this yeah. Point, right? yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's still 16-bit. It's just mm. not, you know, and it's still compatible with, you know, in theory, you could still run the software from that on a modern PC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Apple profits for the year rise. But for the most recent quarter, begin to fall. While Apple saw a rise in profits of 50% and a rise in revenue of 70%, the latest quarter is slightly down as their controversial policies that we've talked about here on the show in recent months to try to limit the number of retailers carrying the machines per geographic area, increase competition from IBM, Commodore et al., and attention to shut down mail order operations start to eat into their profits. Hmm. So remind me again, why would they try to limit the number of retailers actually selling their machines? Uh, well, here's the problem that they have. They were the darling of Computerland, which was the largest chain of computer retailers in the U.S. up until this point. Yeah. Now, uh, Computerland has started carrying the IBM PC as well because, well, that's the new hotness. And the Apple II is really getting long in the tooth. The Apple III, which was supposed to replace it, has been an utter failure. Mm, The Lisa is the next machine coming down the pipeline. That is also not going to do well. Mm. It's going to have a cameo role in Tron, but it's not going to do well. Macintosh won't be out until 84. Uh, so that's still 
long way away. And what they've decided to do is say, hey, if the computer lands are just popping up everywhere and the mom and pop shops that really do a lot of our support and all this stuff are being pushed out of the market because computer land can get bigger bulk discounts on the hardware and stuff, then uh, that's not good for us because if computer land tomorrow decides, no, we're just doing IBM or plays up IBM over Apple, then Apple has no distribution anymore. No, so no. it makes sense for them to say, hey, we're too expensive. The Apple II is still a very expensive machine at this point, even though the graphics and sound on it are crap, to be nice. Uh, yeah, they, well, you've got Prince of Persia. That, that's actually quite a nice game for the Apple II. Well, remember, it's if, if you look at the graphics on, it, on the Apple II, hmm. there's not a lot of color there. No, no, no. It it looks it's dated. It's dated poorly. Yes. Uh, but the thing with the thing that Apple has is uh, they've got a very a relatively large install base. The Vic Twenty is going to wipe that out quickly. But it's an install base that's quite um, quite fanatical for the machine. It's an yes. install base of the hardcore programmers that bought machines early on. This is why Richard Garriott is going to continue designing Ultima games on his Apple II through Ultima V. I mean, this is insane. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and but the Apple II was the tinkerous machine. I mean, the, that that little the expandability of the Apple II was was well unsurpassed for many many years, wasn't it? I. Uh, no, the IBM PC is just as expandable. I mean, it's true, it's true, spots. but that was yeah, yeah, a different uh, different price point as well, wasn't it? it it's it, it's not that far off. Is it okay? I mean, I it's, it, it's twice it, the price. It depends on what stat uh, what stats you're buying it with. If you're buying mm. the really really base machine, it's maybe fifty percent more than Apple II. Okay, okay, but you're still you know you're still getting cga graphics yeah which you know are still better than what the apple II is producing at this point mm. and mm. It, the the often overlooked 16 color graphic mode of uh cga is also nothing to snip uh, to snub uh in comparison now nobody really yeah. uses it but that's another issue entirely because mm. the low resolution but uh, so the Apple II has this problem going forward where Apple refuses to become a cheap computer and at the same time needs to maintain their their dealer support and wants the image of being, you know, if you walk into an Apple dealer, they're not just some teenager who can ring you up. They will actually be able to walk you through and help you with it and turn you into a devotee. Yeah. And yeah. And so this is why they're doing this. They're getting rid of the mail order people. They're getting rid of uh, or li trying to put restrictions on the big chains. And this is why they're going to be losing market share. They are losing market share. It's a growing market, so they're still growing. But as a percentage of the market, they are dwindling. Yeah. And... Uh, that's that's why this latest quarter the numbers are down when everybody else is up and it's going to keep hurting them and this is you could almost say this is the beginning of the end of steve jobs first tenure at apple okay it's going to be a couple more years but you know the the failure of the apple three the failure of the lease of the the financial failure of the mac mm are all going to lead to them just saying, you know what, Steve, you're get get the fuck out. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, he'll um, be back. He'll be yeah, back. He, he will be back. Uh, interesting little side note here, speculation in Byte magazine, is that Apple thinks that dealers offering more service will be a long-term boom uh, over big box stores. They also think that 20,000 units per month Maybe the plateau for Apple II sales. Now, this is Byte Magazine, not mm. Apple's internal. 
yep. with a current install base of 400,000 computers. Hmm. So That's a lot of computers. Yeah, but the VIC-20 is already getting close to this. And remember, the Apple II has been on the market since, uh, what, 77? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's True. not going to be it, – it's not that much. The VIC-2 is basically probably getting close to already – is getting close to passing it already at this point. Yeah. Impressive save number for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So moving – Across the pond, UK government announces micros for schools scheme. UK government has announced that they will cover half the cost of procuring computers for local schools. The other half would have to come from local administrations and parent groups. The only machines that would qualify for this subsidy are the 48K Spectrum, BBC Micro and Tigris. Yes, and most of them would go for the BBC. Most of them are going to go for the BBC, uh, primarily because of the BBC programming, but also because yes. one look at the rubber keyboard on 48K Spectrum yes. lets you know that that's not going to survive when a bunch nope. of kids start pounding away on it. Oh, the BBC was definitely the um, higher quality machine there. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. all three of these are, of course, UK made machines. And uh, it's interesting because this is coming out of a weekly magazine in the UK called Popular Computer and Computing Weekly. And the very next week, Commodore has an announcement in the magazine uh, saying that they're, they are going to start their own foundation for education and to promote the VIC-20 and the PET in the schools. Yeah. And they claim that they are already the most installed computer in UK schools, which actually probably is true because Commodore already had a relatively strong European distribution system going back to the 70s. Mm -hmm. And the PET was one of those go to machines for schools at this point. OK. Hmm. It's not going to help them, but still. No, no, no. The BBC is going to rule this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, much to uh, Sir C future Sir Clive's uh, uh, <laughs> chagrin. Chagrin, yes. <laughs> so moving into the legal space, yes. New York shuts down arcades, but not peep shows. Oh, yes. The city of New York tried shutting down both peep shows and video game arcades, by changing its zoning laws to disallow both types of businesses in certain areas of the city. An appeals judge allowed the closing of the arcades, but not the peep shows, as films, regardless of how they are shown, are constitutionally protected free speech, but video games have no such protection. <laughs> so in the, um, the Puritan US, I, I find this highly amusing, that they, they wouldn't shut down the peep shows, but the, they... The arcade, that's that's evil. We need to shut that down. Yeah, and uh, this actually goes back to uh, an, uh, something that we talked about in our last 20-year uh, jump, where the uh, uh, this this the the idea here that there was no constitutional protection for video games. Mm. Uh, because it hasn't been litigated yet and because you're not necessarily talking and this is as far as i've understood the legal argument here uh it's hard to find uh, documentation on it the legal argument seems to be well if i am a speaker and i create a work of art be it a movie or a book or music or whatever then that's my expression but a video yeah. game isn't seen in the same way because of the interactive uh, attributes. Mm. So the interactivity, as far as I understand it, is, is the linchpin argument here. That the moment the player is deciding what happens, it's not really an expression of an opinion anymore. You know what I'm okay. saying? Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Now, this so is the, obviously the play himself is actually creating the experience and therefore it's not an authored work. 
if that's how you want to frame exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Or it's it's some weird hybrid of them, and so nobody has actually clarified this rule yet. So because there's no prior legal foundation for protecting video games the judge said hey i can't close down the peep shows because those are you know showing little movie clips and Mm. movies are protected even if it's pornography but i can shut down the video games because there is no protection for those so we have the very weird situation where the video games are out but the peep shows in (laughs) yeah wonderful Wonderful. yeah yeah both are coin operated both Mm. are coin operated which is the 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 foundation for the rule but uh yeah go figure Mm. okay on to other news then sega wins uk court battle Yes, the UK case in which Sega was fighting a Frogger copier has led to a decisive victory. The judge ruled that the underlying code is copyrightable under the UK's 1956 Copyright Act. The judge did not rule on Sega's argument that the objects displayed and their sequences were also copyrightable because, according to the judge, it was not necessary in this case as injunctive relief would already be possible. So could you de lawyerify that? What what does okay, injunctive okay. relief mean? Okay, so uh yeah, let me de lawyerify that. Okay, a couple of basic things to understand here. So what Sega was asking for was what's known as injunctive relief. An injunction is a court order that says person so and so, you're not allowed to do something. So an injunction mm-hmm. is always an order prohibiting action. Okay. Uh, And relief means that it will relieve you of some damage or some harm that is coming to you. So an injunctive Mm -hmm. relief would be an order of the court telling somebody not to do something in order to prevent harm to somebody else. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, the issue here was what can be copyrighted? Now, these Frogger guys are not making a new game that looks like Frogger. They're just flat out copying it. And we've talked about this on the show previously, that yeah. because there had not been any leg- uh, any legislation or uh, any specific court cases on this, England had this awkward situation where you could not copyright software. Uh, it was just... Nobody had actually specifically said software's um, uh, covered, and so, you know, it's it's not covered. So making a copy of a game of the code is perfectly legitimate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this judge now for the first time is saying, no, the underlying code is protected. Now, what Sega wanted the judge to say in addition to that was it's not just the code, but it's what that code creates on the screen, the sprites, mm. the sprite yeah, yeah. movement and so forth. But they didn't get that. They didn't get that because mm. and this is a common law principle that uh, the judge, a judge should only decide the uh Basically, once you hit the point where the harm is stopped, once you've made a decision or a ruling that stops yeah. the harm, you don't keep going. You don't have to okay. dig through even more stuff. If you do the smallest, the, the smallest possible decision that gets you to where you want to go is all you need to do. The rest of it is out. Then you and, need to wait <clears throat> for the next court case to, to move it even further. Exactly. And, yeah, okay. and the principle behind that is, you know, if if we can decide that, you know, picking somebody's roses uh, is an illegal taking of somebody else's property and that, you know, you don't have to. Uh, and, and that is the decision to put and that's enough to protect the roses. Fine. We don't all have to figure out, you know, uh, whether or not the breathing of the air around the roses or the preventing somebody else from enjoying the roses or some some other t- t- a deeper question. If 
nobody's going to come on the property anymore to pick the roses, none of those other subsequent harms or other issues that could come up are going to be listened to by the court because otherwise you go down this rabbit hole and you could and you could have a problem where you never come out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, uh, makes perfect, so, perfect sense to me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, de-lawyer fight. Ha ha. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> so the, I'm, I'm go, gonna need help on more of these. I'm sure. Atari extends copyright fight internationally. With the copyright situation in the UK getting clearer for software, Atari is exporting its hunt for Pac-Man infringers to the so far freewheeling UK micro scene. Commodore has been hit with a cease and desist for its VIC-20 Jelly Monsters game and many others such as Bug Bite for its game VIC-Men. Sorry. Atari has also been sending out letters requesting that companies send them copies of their games to make sure they don't infringe, promising to reimburse the companies for the cost of the cassette if they find no infringement happened. A&E, a game publisher for Home Systems, says that they will not comply. Mm. Yeah, seems a bit strict to just say, send us copies of your games if you're okay. Well, we'll pay you. Otherwise, we'll probably make a lawsuit instead. <laughs> well, we'll pay you the cost of the cassette, not the cost of yes. the retail price of the game. No, no. no. <laughs> and of course, you're not allowed to publish the game until we've given you the okay. No, no, no. That, this, that seems a bit harsh. This, yeah, this this is basically Atari coming in. And in the article, a and uh, representatives also talk about how, you know, we we can't afford to fight Atari. But no. we're not going to comply with this because this opens up a can of worms we can't, you know, get rid of anymore. And mm. we can't shut that anymore once it's started. But it's the same type of thing that we saw in the States where Atari was suing everybody making a, a maze chase game. Yeah. Now, granted, a lot of them were just blatant ripoffs of Pac-Man, but still. They're now going after the UK, which so far, you know everybody's making a, a most not most but a huge chunk of the software that's showing up in video game and computer entertainment each uh not no, that's wrong magazine uh video uh, computer and video games computer and video games the big yeah. Uh, yeah. UK magazine. yeah at least 50 if not a larger percentage of the games being talked about every month are just arcade games being illegally ported to these home systems. Yeah. And now that may be coming to an end. Yeah. So. Okay, so uh, somebody sues Atari as well because Astrocade sues Atari and Commodore. Astrocade, makers of the Astrocade console, have announced the filing of a lawsuit against Atari and Commodore for violating their rights to a bitmapping patent that they claim to have exclusive right to through a deal with Bally. The patents were just issued right before the announcement, which was made at the summer CES. Bally refused to join the suit, and Atari dismissed it as frivolous while Commodore sniped that the timing during CS would clearly help Astrocade get some publicity. So what did they actually say that Atari and Commodore had done? A bit mapping patent? What's that? Yeah, uh, I tried to understand the patent on this one. Mm. I honestly could not make heads or tails of most of it. My best guess is that it is a method of simply creating an image. Sorry. It's a very generalized system for creating an image on a screen using a computer. Okay, okay. Uh, Now, I'm probably completely wrong on this. Uh, There's a link to the patent in the show notes. If any of our listeners can decipher that, what's going on in that patent and wants to tell us about it, Please let me know. I'll I'll record you and pop you into the next episode. Uh, mm. Gladly, gladly do that because I really just didn't understand the patent when I tried to read it. Uh, okay. Now this this lawsuit's not going to go anywhere. Bally has actually refused to join the lawsuit, 
yeah. uh, astrocade acid. Now remember, the astrocade started out as the Bally as a Bally product, uh, mm, and okay. they've spun it off. They got they got out of the business. Astrocade bought it, and by buying it, they also got rights to all of the uh, patents apparently that were connected to it, and that's why they're suing. But remember. Bally has just signed a deal with Commodore to port their games to the VIC-20 and the C64 yeah. and so forth. And mm-hmm. uh, and Bally is also having games, you know, released on the Atari. They they have no interest in this. They they don't want to get involved with this. And as far as I can tell, this doesn't go anywhere. Okay. Okay. So in, in even more lawsuit news... Corn nuts sues Midway. Oh yeah, snack food maker Corn Nuts has sued Midway for the removal of Pac-Man from all food items due to the character's resemblance to their logo. Now, uh, uh, this will be in the so, show. So, notes. Corn Nuts has a logo that looks like Pac-Man. Yes. And wants Midway to remove Pac-Man from all food items because they think they own that. Yeah. Now, uh, if you in the show notes and uh, I'll put links, of course, to this in the show notes. But, uh, Mad, since you've never you're not from the States, I added a little image of the Corn Nuts logo in the uh, notes. You can see it yeah. to the right. Yeah. Kind of yeah. looks oh. a little like Pac-Man, like a grinning it Pac-Man. Does. Yeah, it does. it does. And this has been their logo for decades. At this okay. Point. Yeah. Uh, and as far as I can tell, corn nuts are basically just nuts, nuts uh, that have been sprinkled with stuff. Okay. Uh, but this is their logo, and they are demanding that Pac-Man not be licensed to appear on food products because of the similarities. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is kind of similar, but the. Uh, apart from the the cutout, I mean, the mouth of Pac-Man is is more like a, a slice of pizza on Pac-Man, really. Where where this is uh, more curved. Yeah, but it's still it's a circle with a a curved wedge cut out of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I see their argument, but uh, they would have to prove the potential of consumer confusion. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, they're probably going to have more chances of selling more of their product because yes. of the similarity with Pac-Man <laughs> than the other way around. So yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I I don't believe this goes anywhere, uh, but it was a fun little side note in in mm. the greater scheme of Pac-Man related merchandise. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So, ready to dive into the final category here, which is just the miscellaneous news. Yeah. Let's do it. Atari starts a new research lab. Atari has opened a new research lab in New York, headed by company veteran Stephen T. Mayer, to develop new computer tech and to work with other Warner Communications subsidiaries. Hmm. So, what would they... uh... What would they go on to do then? Do you know? Uh, I, n- not a whole hell of a lot because the whole thing's going to blow up right after Christmas. Ah, okay. uh, there's there's <laughs> not, and nothing much that comes out of this as far as I can tell. But the interesting thing about this is the idea that, you know, Atari has become such a juggernaut and is the – the tail wagging the dog of the giant Mm. Warner Brothers Communication Corporation, that they're going to be developing these technologies that are going to be used in other Warner products. Uh, And I mean, one of the things here is, for example, the uh, have you ever seen Superman three? Yes. The one with Richard Pryor. Well, there's a sequence in there where Superman is flying through the Grand Canyon and they shoot some rockets at him and they're controlling the rockets and it, and it's like a video game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they those um, those video game cartoony sequences were actually done on an Atari internal machine uh, that was used to prototype game ideas. Okay. So it was this very yeah. powerful machine where they could develop ideas for the coin op division. 
uh, very quickly before having to then figure out, okay, so now we've got this great game. How do we turn this into manufacturable uh, video game hardware? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so this is why there's a lot of, a lot of the idea of creating synergies between what Atari is doing, which is, you know, high tech, super cool, blah, blah, blah. And the movie division and book divisions and so forth is as far as I can understand from the press releases, the idea of this lab. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Obviously all for not because countdown to the yes. crash. So but, think, yeah. So think, yeah. Okay. But. On to other news, then. The Games Channel wants to take Epic Gaming online. While Mattel's Play Cable may be letting gamers download traditional cartridge games over cable TV systems to the Intellivision, the Games Channel promises to bring down the prices of games and expand the experience with lengthy fantasy and role-playing adventure games that may take months to complete. They won't be relying on existing consoles, but on a bespoke hardware with a full keyboard and control buttons. So they've got their own console that uh, has some RAM that you can uh, reprogram or read from the uh, from the cable cable signal, and then yeah. you get to play a game. Yeah. Yeah, and they're unlike Play Cable, and there's a couple of other services apparently like this coming out around this time. Yeah. Which. Uh, they were not using up an entire cable channel worth of bandwidth. They were trying to um, uh, stick the games into the little bit of bandwidth that was between channels. Uh, play uh, The game channel is literally going to be the full bandwidth of a channel. So in theory, you're okay. going to have yep. a lot more stuff going on. They had all, They end up cutting licenses with most of the major PC manufacturers, Broderbund, Sierra, Epics, all licensed games for them, mm. uh, and also a lot of educational titles and so forth. They get the hardware up and running. There's test markets going. Unfortunately, the company is going to run out of money right before the launch. Mm. It's a very, very big deal. Um, it never takes off. I've actually been in touch with uh, one of the founders of the company, Larry Dunlap, and hopefully we'll be uh, I'll be interviewing him next week. He's never actually okay. talked yeah. about this post uh, the fall of the company. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one if it happens. So fingers crossed next week I'll be recording that and uh, we'll find out exactly what happened with this company. There is a memorial page for the company with some of the old press materials and so forth. Uh, that's linked in the show notes below. It, it is a wonderful idea. I mean, thinking about when this was 1982, distributing new games like that just on, on the cable signal. It's, it's yeah. a wonderful idea. It's, 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 it's a proper sci-fi when you're in 82. <laughs> And the funny thing is, I found the mention of this in Replay magazine, a coin-op magazine. And yeah. coin-op people are deadly afraid of consoles eating their lunch, of being the mm. comp competitor that's going to keep people from the arcades. And yeah, they actually comment in there that, well, at least these guys are going for big, epic role-playing things, which we can't do in coin-op anyway, so it's not really a competitor to us. No, no. Yeah, makes uh, sense. yeah, so it's it'll be interesting to see, you know, what they were planning and, and what the hardware was like and so forth, because those yes. details I don't yeah. have yet. OK, uh, but like I said, if all goes well, I'll be interviewing him next week. Yeah, interesting. I'd yeah. Love, to, love to listen to that. So back to Mac, Steve Wozniak announces the U.S. festival, not the U.S., the us, us. Sorry, the us no Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hoping to herald a new decade of communal consciousness through music, technology, and education, Apple co-founder and designer of the Apple One and Two, Steve Wozniak, is bankrolling the Us Festival, which will hopefully help people come together in the '80s and put an end to the me decade of the '70s. 
So this is incredibly funny to me because this is the the, the company that launched the whole i device <laughs> thing. So I've got well, my that'll... iPhone and iPad and the iMac and and so on. So what yeah. happened to us? Well, us becomes a massive freaking failure. Uh, it is <laughs> so a huge it went money back, loser. back to the me again or I. Well, it, it, okay, this is the beginning of the '80s. There's high hopes. Remember, Wozniak just he he's a nerd. You gotta love the man. He yeah. he really is hoping technology is going to make everything better. He doesn't mm. know what Twitter is yet, uh, and <laughs> or Facebook mm. or any of that crap. And uh, he is really hoping that the technology is going to democratize information and make us all better people. And, of course, the 80s is going to take the greed of the 70s and ramp it up to, you know, 11. It's yes. it's the Gordon Gecko greed is good decade. And so this festival is coming in at just the wrong time. Uh, it's a massive money loser. Interesting on the technology side, it's the first public use of the U.S. Soviet space bridge, which was a, a live satellite video hookup between mm. the United States and Soviet Union. The only problem is they didn't really calculate time differences properly and the quality of the cameras. So when they did turn it on at night and they <clears throat> turned the camera on the people in the crowds, you couldn't actually see anything. It was just a black mass, <laughs> apparently. Uh, okay. Now, they're going to try it again. There's going to be a second US Festival in 1983, which is basically also going to lose money and go nowhere. So that'll be the end of the US Festival. Uh-huh. Okay, okay. But well, hey, back to I then. Yes, back to I. And mm. our last story isn't yes. really the... Larry Kaplan? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. It, it, it's not the end of a company. It's the birth of one. Mm. Yeah. So Larry Kaplan leaves Activision. One of the co-founders of Activision and former Atari game designer Larry Kaplan has left Activision, apparently frustrated with the limitations of the 2600 and wanting to develop a new super system. No details or names are known yet, but it's going to be the Amiga. Oh, yes. Yeah. Everybody loves the Amiga. Or at it's, least I do. Yeah, me too. So, yeah. So he's leaving. Uh, he's going to poach J Minor. Well, poach him. J Minor had also left Atari because he wanted to build a new system with the 6800 chip. And they told him, no, you have to stick with the 6502. He's actually outside of the games industry at this point doing other things. So Larry's going to call him up. They're going to start a company called High Toro. They're going to start working on a new machine called the Lorraine. Larry mm-hmm. Kaplan is actually then going to leave before the end of 82. Uh, I believe he gets sort of talked into trying some new venture with Nolan Bushnell, but Bushnell actually doesn't have anything in the pipeline. So, uh, But Jay Miner is essentially then going to be the guy helming the project, uh, everything's going to get renamed Amiga, and well, that whole story fo- uh, unfolds. But uh, the Arcade Express uh, newsletter for August 30th had uh, this announcement that Larry Kaplan had left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. uh, and they had all these details. He wanted to build the super system. He was frustrated with the 2600. And, uh, yeah, so here we are in August of uh, 82. We're getting this news report that will lead us to the Amiga. Yes, yes. Kind of cool. And a good place, I think, to leave this very, very long episode. So Mm -hmm. uh, only one thing is left, Mads. What is the word of the episode? I'm maybe for the first time ever. I'm gonna pick just one word. It, it's, it has to be. It has to be us because I love the <laughs> fact that, that the, the Apple guys, the the, the founders, the, the creators of the whole I, the the, the very well, what's self-centered uh, product line of I devices, actually had an us festival. I love that. So well, us. okay, okay. Remember, this is Wozniak privately doing it, and yes. the I thing. <laughs> 
just <laughs> smacks of jobs. Mm. Now, yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, the, the first iMac may have predated him, his mm. return to the company. I, I think it may actually predate it. It did it though, because I think the first iMacs actually had the OS X running on them, the very first versions. Oh, and that's OS true. That's true. X was what he brought in from Next, wasn't it? Yeah, you're right. So yeah, that that's just a Jobs thing. You're jobs probably right. The whole about, I thing is a Jobs thing. Yeah. Yeah, and Wozniak yeah. is more the let's come together. Come on. Yes. Yes. So let's let's go with the Woz here. Us. I'm I'm down for that. Okay. Us is the word of the episode. Okay, everybody. Remember, uh, links to everything is in the show notes. Follow us on the Twitter and uh, at some point I've got to update Instagram. If anybody, any nice listener out there wants to repost uh, the Twitter stuff to Instagram or figure out a way for me to do that easily, please let me know because it's uh, I've just given up because doing it on my phone is a nightmare. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, support us on Patreon, uh, Mads, where can everybody find you? So in a minute or two, they can find me in my bed because uh, it's, uh, <laughs> about one o'clock in the night. Do here, you so really I'm want the people tired. who listen to this show finding you in your bed? Probably not all of them. No, no, you're <laughs> right. They can find me at the, the Retro Asylum podcast, where I podcast about all things retro, and on the Playthrough podcast, where we uh, play along with uh, some other guys when we play some middle-aged games, just play through To the Moon, and that was great fun. Just to record that yesterday, actually, I'm, I'm going to be editing it tomorrow. So. Cool. If you're into your middle-aged games, that'll, that'll be where, where you can, can check me out. Sweet. Then uh, the, all the links to that are in the show notes as per usual. Everybody, thanks for listening and have fun. Bye.